what was produced in the Demore Committee. Um, this rationale for us was somewhat more compelling um, in terms of increasing eligibility ages as a response to some of the policy issues. Um, but that was not what was presented by the federal government. So, um, hmm. I one. No. okay. So this chart or this um, slide just basically summarizes the aspect of of the presentation that I'm going to walk through in terms of the analysis that we did uh, for the provincial Ministry of Finance. Um, so we started to explore the impacts of this policy change in a whole range of areas. Uh, we looked at impacts on individuals in terms of their personal retirement income. We looked at impacts uh, on government revenues from an income tax perspective, uh, consumption taxes, sales taxes, the like. And we did some economic modeling of those impacts. And I'll get into that as I walk through my slides. There's also some other important impacts um, on public services generally, whether it's healthcare services, social services, income assistance, welfare, housing, um, all of these public services, most of which are provided by provinces. Um, there is some impact uh, from, that flows from the OAS GIS eligibility age change. And then finally, and somewhat more difficult to quantify, is there's an impact on community-based services, whether you're looking at municipal, local government services, or not-for-profit sector services that are provided to seniors. Um, so we will ex I'll explore in my presentation all four of these areas. Just as a summary of, of the analysis, the research we undertook when we were exploring this policy change, we, we took a threefold approach. Um, we started from a theoretical perspective, uh, drawing from sociological literature and economic literature, looking at concepts like the ripple effect and what happens when you make a policy change in a system and how those changes can influence a whole range of other aspects. Um, and then we took a, a top-down approach, a macroeconomic approach, where we looked at um, how do these changes flow through uh, a whole bunch of economic and fiscal uh, aspects of our economy. Um, so we did some, uh, we, we drew on information provided by the Parliamentary Budget Officer of Canada who did similar macro fis fiscal uh, analysis as well as the analysis by the Office of the Chief Actuary on the effects, the fiscal effects of these changes. And then we did some of our own modeling. Uh, we used uh, Statistics Canada's Social Policy Simulation Database and Model, which is a model that they maintain at Statistics Canada that allows you to model changes, big policy changes, and how they flow through the economy and government revenues. And we also looked at, uh, we used the Conference Board of Canada, which maintains a model for federal provincial fiscal balances to test uh, these changes. Basically, our research designed a baseline um, scenario where the OAS eligibility age change is implemented and run forward over the decades. And then we backed out the OAS eligibility age change in our main scenario and were able to test the difference in terms of impacts. Um, basically, all of these, uh, all of these uh, the modeling we did with uh, the SPSDM model and the, and the conference board model confirmed in, in general magnitude the results that were shown by the Office of the Chief Actuary and the Parliamentary Budget Officer. And I'll talk about those a little bit more in my, in my next few slides. The third aspect of our research was uh, more of a bottom-up approach, a micro approach. And for this, we looked at um, working with other government ministries in the provincial government to assess the impacts of the OAS eligibility age change on provincial programs, whether they be healthcare programs, income assistance, welfare programs, housing subsidies, and the like. And we worked with other provincial ministries of finance 
um, in, in terms of developing this methodology that could then be transferred to other provinces to do their own analysis because these programs are different across every province in terms of their structure and design and the level of cost sharing that occurs in these programs, whether they're income or asset tested. So that's our, the structure of our analysis. When we, when we look at the impact on individuals, what we found, generally speaking, um, is that the changes in eligibility age will uh, reduce expenditures on the program from between 11 and $12 billion annually once fully implemented in 2030. So that's 11 to $12 billion that's pulled out of retirement income. Um, so that was a fairly significant impact in our mind and those results were consistent across the modeling we did as well as what was presented uh, generally by the Office of the Chief Actuary and the Parliamentary Budget Officer. What some of our modeling uh, provided, and this is uh, the beauty of the Statistics Canada SPSDM model, is it measures levels of poverty against a low income measure, which is one measure of poverty. Um, the results from our modeling showed that there would be an increase in poverty for those age 65 and 66 from 65,000 to 160,000 individuals as a result of the change. So we noticed that. Um, we can't really guess how, many, how people will respond to this change, what the behavioral response will be, so we chose not to. In our modeling, we assumed that there was no behavioral response, even though we know that there may be. Um, but not to say that there wouldn't be. We kind of grouped the behavioral responses into five different categories without actually trying to quantify them or include them in our modeling. But basically, you have people who are able to work, who have work available to them, and choose to extend their work life so as to offset some of the impact of a loss of uh, retirement income from OAS. Then another group is those who are able to work but cannot find work in some way. Um, maybe in some cases they will be eligible for provincial welfare, provincial income assistance, or other income supports. Third group is uh, those who are able to work but choose not to and draw on other sources of income or family supports uh, to, to get through in terms of the loss of income. And then the fourth group is those who are not able to work for health reasons. Um, and finally, another group of those who are currently collecting income assistance primarily the disabled or those who have not been successful in finding work for a group for, for an extended period of time. And those last two groups are individuals that will have a fairly significant need in terms of the loss of income uh, from the OAS eligibility age change. So again, rather than trying to identify specifically what the behavioral responses of people will be. We simply left it at these were the possible cases, possible groupings of individuals and how they respond might be different. On government revenues, obviously the, um, there's direct and indirect impacts. Direct impacts for the federal government um, certainly a reduction in federal expenditures on the OAS program, uh, approximately $11 billion. Um, how that flows through in terms of the federal fiscal balances, it could be used for other spending, it could be used for uh, to pay down federal debt, um, or simply listed here as potential federal surplus. Um, other direct impacts, certainly for the provinces and territorial governments. Um, revenues reduced by about $2 billion, lower income and consumption taxes. Uh, what we also noticed is the loss of revenue um, would result in an increase in tax expenditures for a provincial government of approximately $70 million. Indirect impacts. Um, Basically, in terms of the modeling we conducted, uh, nominal GDP 
would have been projected to be almost $7 billion lower as a consequence of this policy change. That's a result of less consumption in the economy, um, corporate profits lower, fewer jobs. These were some of the results that came out of our projections. Um, those, those impacts have recurrent effects in other areas of federal and provincial programs and even cost sharing between the federal and provincial governments. One thing we noticed um, quite quickly is fiscal arrangements between the federal and provincial governments in terms of transferring dollars from the federal government to provincial government for certain programs. Uh, the Canada Health Transfer, for example. The growth in those transfers is directly related to the growth in nominal GDP. So lower nominal GDP means lower growth in fiscal transfers to provincial governments. So a bit of a challenge there. And this is kind of our bottom-up approach, our micro approach, where we looked at public services um, that are provided across provinces and even in the federal government. Specifically, we identified areas in terms of welfare, income assistance, seniors' benefits, um, income supports, residential care and housing subsidies, home health and community care, and prescription drug benefits. All of these programs have income testing or asset testing as part of cost sharing mechanisms within the public service program. So you get a dual effect on these programs. First you get greater need for these programs in terms of demand for the services and secondly you have an impact from the personal income hit that retirees take on the level of cost sharing within the programs. Um, and as I mentioned earlier uh, Different regions of the, of the country, different provinces have different structures to their programs in these areas, different levels of income or asset testing. It's very complicated. Um, the final area that surprised us when we started to look at this uh, is that we did a search of provincial and territorial statutes and regulations that are in some way linked to OAS or age 65, have some reference to those parameters. And what we came up with was quite shocking, that <laughs> approximately 157 pieces of legislation, provincial legislation and federal legislation, and nearly 300 regulations were identified in the search. These things will need to change in some way, and it's a fairly significant undertaking for both provinces and the federal government to specifically identify those uh, legislation and regulations and make the necessary amendments. So. That was a big piece that we uncovered. Um, community services, not-for-profit sector, very difficult to quantify the impacts in these areas, um, but certainly we know there will be impacts in some way. The one area that we were able to produce some analysis on was food banks. There is a report by uh, the Food Banks of Canada. Uh, they do a national hunger count every year, and their report in 2013 identified that nearly just over 833,000 Canadians uh, utilize food banks in 2013. And between four and 6% of those individuals were people over age 65. So with the results that we saw in terms of increases in seniors' poverty, you're going to see increases in those numbers. Um, and certainly that flows through into effects on seniors groups, groups that provide support services for seniors, municipal programs that provide support for seniors, faith groups, and family supports that are called on to fill the gap for those individuals. So in essence, th this idea of a ripple effect for changes of this nature, eligibility age changes have an impact on the broad economy, on broader society and it's very important to consider all these things holistically when you're making a change to a, a social security program. These are a few of the reports that I mentioned in my presentation. Um, Jean-Claude's actuarial report on the old age security program, conference board's report on uh, fiscal balances for the federal and provincial government and the parliamentary budget officers report. Um, and that's the end of my presentation.